thanks very much for coming, Patrick. Great, great. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for inviting me, um, Jason. Um, this has been a great, great talk so far, a great conference so far. I mean, the previous, this talk hasn't been that great so far. It's only been a minute long. Um, but uh, I, I, so I'm gonna be talking about estimating assortative mating and the implications of, of assortative mating for um, human behavior and social preferences and these sorts of things. I, I unfortunately don't have um, any Charles Darwin references in, in my talk at all. So um, don't just have to make those connections yourself. Um, so um, first off, just what is assortative mating? Um, well, the basic idea is, is that it's a phenomenon where parents are more similar than you might um, expect under a model of random mating where people's, um, people's spouses are essentially just drawn randomly from the population. So this can happen um, within a trait. So you could have something where like tall people are more likely to have children with tall people. Um, but you could also imagine it happening across traits. So you might have tall people are more likely to have children with educated people or something like that. And so we're gonna talk about both, both types of assortative mating. Throughout this talk, I'm going to, um, just for simplicity, in all of my examples, talk mostly about the single trait stuff, but at the end, I'll give an example about cross-trait assortative mating and, and why that's important as well. Um, there's been a lot of work done on assortative mating in general. Um, it's widespread in humans across a bunch of different traits. Here's just four examples of papers looking at a number of, of, of traits. Um, but you know, the main question is why should we worry about this? Um, well, this, here's, a, here's a handful of reasons um, that we might be interested in. This is not exhaustive, of course, but, but some, some reasons why assortative mating might be interesting to us is that um, assortative mating has um, implications for income inequality and intergenerational mobility. So if you imagine people sorting on, on SES-related outcomes, um, that could affect how wealth is distributed through society and that might have translations into um, health, health considerations. Um, it also has effects on, on public health and disease prevalence. And so if people are sorting on, on uh, traits that cause disease, um, this leads to people just generally having more extreme traits in the population. And so you might see an increase in, in certain types of diseases. Um, assortative mating um, doesn't cause geographic mobility, but, but you could think of it as a type of, of geographic mobility, where if, if people are sorting strongly on, on where they're from, um, then that is an implication that uh, you know, people maybe aren't moving very much within the country that they're in. So um, you might be able to estimate a sort of mating on, on you know, geographic origins and, and that might suggest something about how mobile the population is. Um, uh, also importantly, is assortative mating has, has big implications for how we interpret our genetic studies. So in the, in the slides that um, Elliot presented, he showed these genetic correlations. And if, if you pay close attention to it, or if you'd seen that slide before, you would have seen that like education is genetically correlated with everything, like every kind of health outcome that you can imagine. Um, however, you know, and, and often people use that to imply like, oh, it's because education is, is causing these other health things, or maybe there are common biological pathways. Um, however, assortative mating also can produce these, these genetic correlations in this way. And so that would be important to know if we want to try to interpret kind of these simple observational statistics that we see like genetic correlations. It'd be, it'd be good to know how much of it is, is assortative mating versus other types of pathways that we might be more interested in. Um, uh, the tricky thing is that it's, it's, a, it's estimating assortative mating is, is hard to do. Um, if you wanted to do it in a direct, straightforward way, what you would do is you'd gather a large sample of parent pairs. Um, hopefully in your sample, it's measured the outcome in, in all of these parents. So you could make, maybe take the correlation of the outcome between these two parents. And, and ideally you would have this outcome measured um, before the parents even met, because you worry about maybe some sort of reflection problem. If you think of BMI, for example, you know, there's a high correlation of spousal BMI if you look at the observational data that way. But you, you can't tell if um, that's because spouses are, are, you know, were at higher risk of obesity before they met or if it's because these spouses are spending a lot of time together, they maybe have the same diets, and so there's a convergence of, uh, of their BMI over time. And so those, those, those would be different, different kinds of processes. Um, so what I'm going to propose here is, is a, as a new method for estimating assortative mating. We're more precisely going to be estimating genetic assortative mating. Um, and what I mean by that is it's the correlation of a genetic predictor for the outcome between parents. And so instead of looking at the correlation for BMI, we're going to look at the correlations of genetic risk for BMI, creating a genetic predictor. Um, 
the handy thing about that is genetic um, data are fixed at conception. And so you don't have to worry about you know, convergence of BMI over time. Um, you don't have to have measurements of the outcomes to be able to do this. As long as your data are genotyped, um, then, you know, and, and you have good predictors of those outcomes um, based on genetic data, um, then you can measure sorting on, on anything you want. Um, and, and an important feature of this method that's, that's maybe the most novel thing is that we're going to, uh, we've developed a method that allows us to infer what the correlation is in the parental genetic predictors just using the children's data. So because children inherit their DNA from their parents, if we just had a population of, of unrelated individuals, we could use that information to then infer how much sorting there must have been in the parents' generation. Um, so uh, I'm not gonna be able to go deeply into the method, but the intuition behind the approach is that um, what we do is we, we create a bunch of polygenic indexes or a polygenic index, sometimes also called a polygenic score. Um, and if there's a sort of mating in the population, then you see an increase in the variance in the polygenic indexes in the population. And so if we know how much inflation there is in the variance, we can then use that to back out how much sorting there must have been one generation ago. Um, let me just give a little bit more detail. So um, I, I was almost sure that someone would have talked about um, polygenic scores or polygenic indexes before me. So I didn't, didn't create any slides about that. Um, but for those who, who haven't really seen polygenic index uh, research before, what you do is if you wanna predict some outcome Y, it's just a weighted sum of genotypes. So in this case, this X is going to be the zero, one, two counts of how many of a certain allele you have at a particular SNP, and you weight it by, by some factor. Usually this is based on the genome-wide association studies of the sort that Elliot talked about in, in his talk. And when you're done, you have a, a predictor that, that is often quite good at, at, predict, at predicting certain kinds of outcomes. We're quite good at predicting like height and education. Uh, we're getting better and better at, um, depending on the outcome. Um, so here's our definition of our polygenic index. Um, if we were to take the variance of this thing, um, well, for those of you who um, remember a little bit of your stats, um, the variance of a sum like this has a bunch of direct uh, terms, but then a bunch of covariance terms across the SNP pairs. Now, if there's random mating, because of the way we inherit our genomes, SNPs should be uncorrelated across chromosomes. And, and if you took every pair of SNPs in the genome, the vast majority of these things are going to be um, cross chromosome pairs. And so we have a whole lot of terms that would be exactly zero in, um, in, a, in a random mating setting. However, if there's a sortative mating, um, something different is gonna happen. So here's, here's a quick example of how correlations could, could show up even across chromosomes in a, in a sorting population. So imagine you have two alleles, A and B, on different chromosomes. And, and both of these have a causal influence on height. Um, but they're on different chromosomes, so in a randomly mating population, they should be uncorrelated. However, in our sorting population, if we have a child who has a copy of allele A, then they got that allele from their parent. And so their parent should have a copy of that allele as well. Um, because this is a causal height SNP, that means that parent one is going to be taller. If parents are sorting, this means that on average, the other parent will also be taller. And if that parent is taller, then it means that the second parent is more likely to have every allele that is height increasing. And if they're more like, including allele B, and so if they're more likely to have allele B, they're, they're more likely to pass it on to their child. And so even though A and B are in different chromosomes, because we have a sorting population, you can get correlations of SNPs um, even across chromosomes and just everywhere in the genome. And so going back to this equation here, in a randomly mating population, this thing is going to be mostly zeros. But in a, in a sorting population, all of a sudden, these, there's, there's you know, perhaps trillions of these pair combination pairs that are slightly positive, and they can add up to be pretty substantial. And so they'll, they'll increase the variance in, um, in the polygenic indexes, indexes that, that we produce. Um, so again, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to go through um, the method of how we take this increase in variance and then actually turn that into parental correlations. I'm just going to assert um, that I can do it. I, I'm happy to talk to anyone about that at another time when I have more than 20 minutes. Um, but uh, the features of this estimation strategy is that you know, when we're done, what we should have are estimates of the correlation of polygenic indexes between parents. 
Um, a nice feature of the, of the method is that it allows us also to estimate how assorted mating is changing over time. So we're not only gonna get kind of overall estimates of the correlation of the population, but we'll be able to say something about, oh, is, is this going up or is it going down um, in, in recent years? Um, it doesn't require data on parent pairs. And so we're going to be applying this to data on unrelated individuals in the UK biobank. And it's a very large data set. We can get very precise estimates, even though we don't really have direct information on any parent pairs um, in, in the data that we're using. Um, another thing we can do is we can correct for population stratification. Um, and so you, you might worry that that um, if people are just distributed geographically throughout the data, that there might be something that looks like sorting on a phenotype, but it's actually just geographic sorting your data. We can correct for that with um, using principal components. And I have an example showing that this works quite well. Um, and, and another final important feature is that our, that our method is robust um, to selection under, under pretty weak assumptions. And so even though the UK Biobank is a, is a highly selected sample, um, our results should, should even be robust to, to that selection. Um, so in my remaining time, I'm gonna go through six very short empirical examples of, of you know, estimates of assortative mating and talk a little bit about why I think they're interesting and what we can learn from them. Um, the like I said before, um, the data that we have, we're gonna create, oh, I say polygenic score weights here, but yeah, we're gonna create our, our polygenic index weights using GWAS summary statistics, generally from just publicly available data sets. Um, for in one example, I'm going to um, produce um, my, my weights using data from the UK Biobank, where I'll do a half and half split. Um, and then I'm going to estimate how much sorting there is in, in half of the UK Biobank. I've randomly split it in half to get our, our correlation estimates. Um, I restricted my sample to just those with European ancestries. Um, it would be great if we could uh, have more diverse research like, like Lauren had, but we're, there are some technical difficulties with extending it to, to more diverse samples currently. Okay, so here's, here's my first example. And so I'm gonna talk about sorting on, on latitude of birth. And so this goes back to this idea of geographic mobility. It turns out that you can predict um, where a person's from within the UK just using their genetic data um, pretty well. I think the, the R squared of the polygenic index is something like you know 30%. Um, and so if we look at how correlated a person's predicted latitude of birth is, um, and how correlated the parents' predicted latitude of birth are, um, that might give us a, a guess of how much people are moving around in the country. And so if we just did the, our, our raw approach, um, we see pretty high correlations, especially in these later years, you know, that parents have a correlation of about 0.5 for latitude of birth. We see that in, in the earlier years, so, you know, throughout the 40s and early 50s, it's, it's much lower. I think that's reflective of probably just the mobility in the years during and shortly after World War II. Um, but, but I think this is a, a pretty good positive control. This is, this is not much different than what we would expect. This is 100% population stratification though, right? Like these predictors aren't, aren't anything related to people's risk of, of latitude. It's just, it's, um, we're just predicting where people are from. Um, if we use our, our correction using principal components, we see that this entire signal just disappears. And so this is a, a nice negative control. There's no sorting on latitude once we control for um, you know, the first 10 principal components, just like we would expect. So this might give us additional confidence that in the subsequent results that I'm about to show you, which all of which control for PCs, um, that actually may be more reflective of sorting on, on the phenotype that we're, we're targeting rather than just geographic sorting due to population stratification. Um, so one phenotype that, that is, it's well-documented, it's, um, so this is another kind of positive control. You know, it's, it's been well-known people sort um, on, on height. And so if we apply our method to the UK Biobank, um, we, we see the same sort of thing. The correlation of predicted height between parents um, is, you know, roughly 0.15. It seems to be slightly increasing, meaning that the parents of children born in around 1970 have slightly higher correlated predicted height than the parents of children born in, in 1940. Um, but this is, this is, again, I think pretty consistent with what's been shown previously, um, both in phenotypic and genetic evidence. Um, a more controversial example is, is sorting on educational attainment. So, so I don't think it's at all controversial that people sort on education and other socioeconomic status uh, type outcomes. Um, however, there's a question about how, how has that been changing over time? And so there was a paper in 1940, of 1914, 2014, um, that says people are sorting more strongly on education now than they have in the past. 
Um, that was followed up with work saying, oh, that was just due to some statistical artifacts of how they coded their variables um, and that people sorting has stayed the same in, in recent years. When we look at genetic sorting, we find evidence consistent with Greenwood. So we see a, a high level of sorting on, on predicted education in general. It's much higher in, uh, for parents of the children born in 1970 than those born in, in 1940. And so you know, this might have implications for um, you know, income inequality and, and intergenerational mobility. Um, BMI, I think, is an interesting example. I gave this again at the beginning. There's, there's a you know, strong uh, phenotypic uh, correlation between parents of BMI in, in the US in general. Um, and the question is how much of this is people sorting on, on risk for obesity and how much is it just parents um, also you know, having the same environment and the same diet over time? Um, so when we look at the correlation of predicted BMI um, in the UK biobank during the time frame that we have our data here, we have like slightly, slightly positive um, estimates here. Um, but but generally quite low. So I, I think these are technically statistically significant, right? Um, but about 0.02. I think this you know this is much smaller than the phenotypic correlations that we see. And so I think this is suggestive that the, the spousal correlations that we see um, in BMI and, and rates of obesity have, have more to do with environmental factors than than um, sorting or genetic risk. Um, autism is is uh, another similar story. You know, it, I, people have there've been a, a huge interest. In, um, in autism recently because you know, we've seen a doubling in the rates of autism in the past 20 years. Um, there's a lot of reasons that people have hypothesized why this is, including changes in diagnostic criteria um, or, or you know, um, more willingness to you know, general awareness of these kinds of issues. Um, but there's also been some people suggesting that this might actually be due to sorting. So you have couples who, you know, they're both kind of high powered, kind of on the autism spectrum, um, then having children. And because they're both, you know, high on the autism spectrum, um, they're more likely to have children that have, you know, extreme draws and, and therefore are diagnosed with autism. Um, and so we tried to, to test that as, as well in our study, creating a genetic predictor for autism. And, and we have, you know, a, an estimate of roughly zero across all years here. Um, one of the problems with this, so you know, this could be evidence against um, the role of sorting in increasing autism rates. Um, the autism polygenic indexes that, that we have available right now aren't incredibly predictive currently. And so it might also just be that we just don't have the power to, de to detect the correlation between spouses with, with current in this indexes and it'll get better. Um, you know, we'll be able to see this more in the future um, as those predictors improve. Um, and so finally, as my last example, I want to talk about um, an example of cross-trait assorted mating. And so, you know, remember, I, I mentioned at the beginning, there's these strong genetic correlations between education and, and a lot of outcomes, including um, psychiatric outcomes like depressive symptoms. And so the genetic correlation of education and depressive symptoms is, is negative 0.3 which might make you think that there might be a causal relationship between them, you know, going, getting more school makes us more depressed. Um, we maybe all relate to that slightly. Um, it could go the other direction, that depressed people decide to stay in school longer, um, or it could just be that there's common biological pathways, or it could just be that people sort um, and you have um, educated people more likely to have children with depressed people. Um, and that's driving up the, the observed genetic correlation that we see. Um, so when we use um, the method that we developed to estimate what fraction of this negative 0.3 genetic correlation is due to sorting, um, it changes slightly over time, but in the most recent years, it looks like almost a third of the genetic correlation that we see is just driven by sorting and, and not due to any sort of common biological factors. Um, and so this you know, has implications for how we interpret the kind of research that's being done. Um, so just quickly in, in summary, um, you know, I showed um, this method that I, I think is pretty powerful. It's a way to estimate assorted of mating even in large sample sets of unrelated individuals. And, and I think that these can really help us think about um, human behavior and think about the research that we're doing and, and how we should interpret um, you know, the kinds of results that, that we're uh, producing and consuming. Um, so thanks, this has been a, a project that I've done with lots of other people. I also especially wanna thank Michael Bennett, Rosalie, Lee, and Grant Goldman, who are research assistants who have helped out um, on, this, on this project. Um, so that's it for me. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, questions from the audience, if you'd like to raise your hand, there's kind of a lot to digest there, I think. Uh, Lauren, do you have a question? Uh, 
I, sorry, I do actually have a question. I, well, this is fascinating, Patrick. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious if you've looked at more of these cross trait associations, because that's something that I hadn't really thought about that being a potential pathway for why we see associations between these, these different uh, phenotypes genetically or not whatever, but, you know, have you looked at like alcohol and education or, or other, um, any other cross traits? Yeah, so we haven't yet. And so this kind of, uh, this, this is kind of work, in, work in, in progress. We have plans to, to, to do all those things. You need to have strong um, predictors in order to get really reliable estimates. Um, and so, you know, it, it might be difficult to do it for certain outcomes where we just don't predict it very well yet. Um, but but I, I think it's, yeah, super important, super interesting. We'd like to do that. Elliot, I see your hand. That was really interesting, Patrick. Um, I'm just curious, I, you were talking, I mean, obviously you're using the PGIs um, as the kind of the, the, the object from which you're drawing your, um, uh, your data. Um, but I think that you had some of the, uh, either the labels and the axes or the, your language said that it was, that you were inferring, um, uh, what the correlation was of the PGIs and the parents, whereas with this one that you actually have up, it's the fraction of genetic correlation. So I was curious, is, are, 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 we interpret, are we supposed to interpret these as the correlations amongst the PGIs or the genetic correlations? Because the PGI correlation, of course, um, you know, is attenuated due to, to estimation error. And then the, the, the kind of related question for that is, um, you know, if you were to do, you know, use a polygenic index to just predict variation in one of these phenotypes for different cohort um, cohorts, birth cohorts, you would find in for some of them that the R squared changes over birth cohort. And I was wondering to what extent the correlations transforming are just an epiphenomenon of that versus robust to that issue. Yep, those are both great questions. Um, so for your first question, um, so yeah, in this one, I talk about fraction of genetic correlation. It's technically fraction of um, the correlation of the PGIs. However, um, the attenuation of that correlation is, is the same amount as the attenuation that we have of the correlation due to uh, sorting. And so, so, you know, that attenuation, I think, cancels out when we take the ratio to produce these estimates. And so I, I do think that, you know, I, interpreting this as the fraction of genetic correlation is, is reasonable. Um, for, for the, in front of your other question, actually, so that, I think that's interesting. So the issue is that, you know, if you could imagine that sorting on education has stayed constant over time, um, but the predictive power of the PGI has increased. And, and so that would be reflective of something exactly like this, right? Because, you know, the, the correlation of the PGI is, is, is going up, but it's just because education is staying the same. It, um, it turns out that that pattern is backwards. So let me, let me, I can show you, we, we've done what you, what you said. So if we look at the R squared, we split our data into thirds, we see that the correlation, like the R squared of the PGI is decreasing over time. And so what, what that suggests is that, you know, if, if we think that the primary confound is this changing in R squared, then the actual sorting on education that is implied by this curve is, is, is steeper than, than what I'm reporting here. Um, for the other phenotypes I showed, it's actually quite flat. The only one that shows a slight trend in, in the R squared is education and it goes in the opposite direction. Awesome. Those are really interesting things that you've already anticipated. 